You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hey, everybody. This is Abhinav Narayan, our moderator for the episode. Hey, Cecil. How's it going? Good. How you doing, Abhinav? Doing great. Excellent. For this episode, we were talking about the power of illustration. Oh, yes. Why, why is this topic important? It's um, important because it's such a visual thing that we do, right? In entertainment, uh, we're trying to entertain guests visually right. um, and orally. But in order for us to create what I consider instructions to build, we have to all be on the same page of what we're creating. And so, like narrative and scripts and stories, we have that in parallel. We have also the visuals that have to reflect our vision. And so, illustration is a key component to that. And there's so many layers to what we do when we talk about illustration. Absolutely. And uh, who's joining us in this conversation? Today, who's joining us is our senior concept artist, Patrick Riley. Good to be here. Our um, concept artist, Adam Frank. How's it going? And our creative director, Mike Wallace. Hey, good to be back. Okay, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started, and we'll loop back for uh, final thoughts with you, Cecil, at the end of the conversation. Perfect. Sounds good. I wanted to start by actually taking a moment to first define all of the different types of art pieces that you guys do, Mm -hmm. because when we think of art, we think of concept art, but it can be a bit more than that. So could you guys help me kind of flesh out what are the different types of pieces that you normally work on? So we're we're in a... We're in a brainstorming session. We're talking about a new project, whatever that might be. You guys are already pads out, pencils in hand, you know, riffing off whatever we're talking about there. Already doing sketches. Actually. Yeah, it, it comes back into you into your desk, I guess, and yeah. you start to evolve it into what's necessary. Yeah. I think the the question at hand though is, you know, it's we're doing we're doing concept art, we're doing character look dev, we're doing yeah. architectural illustration that's interior exterior. We're doing key art, giant uh, environmental show type Mm. pieces that are just meant to excite. We're doing pieces that are meant to inform, that are supposed to Mm. go to, you know, depending on whether you're sending this off to somebody who is the the touchy-feely artist type or the builder. It's completely different (laughs) types of art. Actually, we figure out illustrating the uh, actual story. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than uh, sure. jumping around on characters and vehicle designs and stuff like that, it's always fleshing out uh, the visuals of the story first. Yeah, and it then seems later like... on, you know, start figuring out what kind of characters we're going to do and what style it's going to be, if it's going to be cartoony or more fantasy based or, you know, whatever it is. So. Yeah, it seems like we start out on a broader spectrum and then kind of narrow it down as we need to get to where we need to. Pick up the one thing that looks cool and be like, oh, let's go with that. Yeah, let's <laughs> go with that, yeah. So as you jump around between piece to piece, do you feel like there is a different process that you have to go through for each one? Or even though the medium is different, does it feel like a relatively steady process that is always the the right? Yeah, it's kind of like a subconscious thing, I think, with the process. Everybody does their process a little bit different, but like, in a way, it's all the same. The same steps of course. that you go through. The yeah, same I mean. steps, just a different style. I mean, yep. to, whether it's to fit the project, whether it's storyboards, whether it's concept art, whether it's an illustrative plan, it usually starts. It sounds like it starts from sketch to broader thumbnail mm-hmm. to then first pass and yeah, then to final absolutely. rendering. Yeah. yeah, depending on the client, then it's like changes or no changes or <laughs> yeah. uh, revisions. Many many changes. <laughs> many many revisions. Right. Well, watching you guys work, I feel like it does it does differ a little bit in the start, depending on the mm-hmm. timeline that we have. And the type of piece again, kind yeah. of going back to that. If if we have three days to get something out, yeah, we're gonna have to skip step three, yeah. four, and five. We'll get to you know six, you know. Or well, yeah, in, in the effort of expediting that, yeah. it's better if the drafting team or modeling team or somebody gives you something to go off of. If we can mm-hmm. even mass up what the exterior, what the interior, what the volume. Sometimes is. all it takes is just a. a, a a rectangle or a box on, on a you know <laughs> on, on, a, on an environment. That's, that's it. True. You know, just something to build off of. Yeah. Honestly, stick figures really like, <laughs> do quite a bit of storytelling. That makes me mean? feel very good. Yeah, yeah, because no. <laughs> that's about all I can do. And that's usually what it starts with: stick figures and real, real rough, you know, boards or thumbnails. And that's yeah, it. absolutely. I mean, I sometimes even start with just an abstract shape, and kind of like if I'm creating a landscape, usually create some type of 
a very cool shape and has a lot of translucency to it or colors or you know value and contrast well, that's a difference from the way that I have to start stuff when I mean my I can't come close to what you guys can do from a, a character and environment standpoint but architectural rendering and and plan rendering that kind of stuff almost always starts for me with a background or uh, a collage of something else something that I've done before yeah. like if, if it's if it's an illustrative master plan, it's going to start with here. I know this piece from this other park worked really well, or this thing that I had in my head that I sketched a long time ago, and I'll lay that on and kind of rearrange the pieces there to make sure the underlay makes sense yeah. spatially. <clears throat> it sounds like I mean you don't have to do that really. Compositionally, you might have yeah. to do that, but yeah. sometimes yeah, we do have kind of free range of what mm -hmm. we need to do with an art piece. I, mean, I think it's <laughs> similar to everybody, not just you. It's like where you recall something you've done before. It's like even in, when we're in a meeting and. You know they're laying out the idea for a new project it's like everybody's mind always goes to something they've they've done in the past or something they've experienced in the past totally and they, they use that to lock onto that to start getting a, something we've been trying to push into a project out. for the last 10 years <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah. i'm, I'm going to continue drawing this until yeah. it fits until somewhere. It <laughs> makes it out yeah. there can we talk a little bit about uh, the role that reference plays in the process because working with you all, all of you guys i know how big of a part of the plan that is yeah gathering reference images well, usually first starts with getting a, a style and a look for it yeah. and usually in a meeting we'll refer to something else like a movie or you know a game or something sure. or even mm -hmm. a, even something not even a game or a movie just a period in time just to get an idea and then we'll start doing research and getting reference images from like that period of time or this specific movie or a genre or something and then we build out from there so if you're if you're looking at a piece that you need to do and we start gathering references what what do you what is usually the first thing that you're looking for is it color? Is it tone? Does it really depend that much on, on a case-by-case -case basis? I think it kind of goes back to the same way like we start our process. That's a beginning process of it. We're thinking about like the whole entire thing instead of thinking about maybe a color or a specific shape or something like that. But it definitely goes along with like the style and how it actually feels to us, I think. I think that has to be a lot of the basis of it. But I mean, I'm for me to get my point across to you guys, it's it's always reference imagery. Mm -hmm. It's this this room needs to feel like this. This space yeah. needs to feel like this, and it's it never really is taken one to one. Which you know, obviously, it should never be taken one to one. We're always trying to innovate and, and do the new thing here, but that is the the quickest way to impart the intent without having to mm -hmm. sit and do a rudimentary sketch or something like that. It, it is faster to grab that reference image, which is why you find our reference folders are taking up 90% of the space on all of our servers all the time because it's you know hundreds and hundreds of photographs for every little <laughs> bit of a thing that we work that on. That also yeah. depends on the story. You know, if you have a darker story, you're going to look for reference images at a more darker tone, depending yeah. on what it is, or a lighter tone, Good more point, cartoony. Actually, yeah. it's, it's, never, it's never like exactly this thing. Yeah. The reference is almost always feeling. It's emotional yeah. based more than it is exacting yep. and you don't Absolutely. want it to be exactly like that right. either. you just want that to get a feel for it and then you can start and branch off and do your own thing yeah. I think that's why we bring up movies and video games too is because when people play them or watch them they get a certain you know feeling from them and you kind of want to feel that again and some type of other thing so it's like <laughs> it's, yeah you stitch it together it's, yeah it's helpful to have a studio full of nerds and, and whatnot <laughs> yes yeah. absolutely that yeah, shorthand man. of Oh, it's like this movie. It's like this anime. It's <laughs> yeah. like this game. Yeah, and there's there's always, there's always a me part in the meeting where it's like, well, I'm trying to figure out this one style, this one look. I want to get this feeling across. And there's always somebody raises, oh, I know what you're talking about. It's yeah. this movie or that, Absolutely. you know, a video yeah. game or something like that. And, and, then, and there's oh, usually like there might be one person in the room where you have to pull up a YouTube video. To show yeah, it. everybody else yeah. just oh, gets yeah, it right yeah. away. Yeah. No, but everybody loves that. Everybody wants to see it again. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we all get very excited when we start getting that. You mean rhythm you going, you know game? what I mean? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you have to play it. Go home and play this right now. <laughs> exactly. For for research, for research. Yeah. <laughs> That's all of my video games are all research. <laughs> Every movie that to I own is research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so much more. What project's that for? Like, oh, to do, to, don't worry about it. <laughs> How do you balance the challenge of evoking emotion in a piece versus evoking reality? Uh, and and which is the greater challenge? Well, you have to, I think you have to figure out what your limits are on creating an attraction, how far you can go before it's like 
you know you can't go any further it's like just not possible you know tech with technology and stuff yeah it's, so you want to get that middle ground reality and just right before it's like you can't go any further on it and it's like still within the realm of what we can do there's a point where it becomes yeah like, this would be ridiculous yeah, yeah. that's a, a unique feature i think of our studio where we're always designing for construction we don't yeah. want to we're spinning our wheels if we're yeah. putting out concept art that oh this this wall is floating well no it's not yeah. so we're not going to show that to anybody yeah, yeah it so. does sound like there's always that risk yeah. of yeah. You know, you want to sell the project, but yeah. you might be selling them on the wrong part of the project. Yeah. Well, it depends on who you're dealing with, too. I mean, yeah. if, if it's creative to creative, you can do that kind of thing. If it's yeah. creative to builder, you need to be showing them some more reality. If it's creator to executive owner yeah. of the client, they might only be interested in what is the flashiest, most ridiculous piece that yeah. I can put out, that I can Absolutely. market with, yeah. you know, and... It doesn't have to be real at all. It, it's yeah. purely about feeling and you know, yeah, it's, it's billboard yourself. billboard esque. It's know? like we're not gonna be we're not gonna be able to get you this, you know, but we'll still be able to get the same emotion you would get yes. with this, and that's yeah. what's important. It's and the feeling that makes that, you. Yeah. It's the feeling of the yeah. image that yeah. you're selling. It's also a lot of knowing, like doing research about your client beforehand, you know, mm -hmm. and figuring out what what they're interested in, and you know, and, and just well, in what, are, what are their needs? Yes, are, exactly. Are, are they going to? Is the client going to have to pitch this to somebody else? Are they going to need to be able to sell your design without you in the room? Mm. Therefore, the art has to speak for itself, or the art has to speak to something greater than that picture. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How do you tailor art for specific clients? It's something that is never inherent in anybody. It's so many variables yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, n you're never going to come out of school or you know the first time you put pencil to paper know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's a process that kind of starts with sitting in client meetings, understanding the types of comments they make on art to then start to tailor it better in round two. Mm -hmm. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to do it in round one. More often than not, I would have a general idea of the type of thing that I'm making. If it's a dark ride, if it's an environment, if it's a character, whatever that might be. This is how I have proposed or positioned those things before. Let me do that. I felt it was successful and let me put it in front of this client and get their reaction. Mm -hmm. And then after that first reaction, now all of a sudden, oh, they gravitated to this image. Why? They gravitated to the color of it, the size of it, the scale of it, the, the emotional intent of it. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, every other image starts to slowly turn to look more like that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, the next meeting that you have with that client, all of a sudden there's five things they like and only one that they don't, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you just, you work it, <laughs> you work it little by little as yeah, you like get chipping away. You know, you get to chip yeah. away what they don't like, what they like. And then eventually it just funnels down into, you start getting more focused on what, what they're looking right. for. There's always really one stakeholder. Mm -hmm. You just have to identify them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you have to and everybody wade thinks through. A you know? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to wade through a lot of folks. But there's, I've had past projects where, you know, there's three or four different levels of art direction and creative direction, but there's really one guy who gets to decide yeah. if that's the that's way it's going to be or not. Zone, yeah. yeah. And there's there's usually one other person under them somewhere that kind of knows what they're thinking. And then you can start to rely on that person, and they'll they'll give you better insight. Mm -hmm. Doing it any other way, you know, tailoring yeah. things to that <clears throat> that second, third, and fourth middleman just means that you're going to get to redo things a lot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it, and if you show the client something that's in a way way too unrealistic or out of their expectation, you're going to get them hyped up for something that isn't achievable. You know, it's not. Um, you, you can always have an abstract, you know, way of look showing it to them. But like Mike was saying about having that construction structure underneath it, you know, and having a, the understanding of, is this going to be built? Um, that's a very important thing to think about. How does art and illustration and themed entertainment differ from other industries? I'll start with when I first graduated from college. Um, when I graduated, I wanted to become a video game artist. I mean, I, I did an internship for a video game and I was, I was dead set on it. And then I started applying to video game studios and realized how oversaturated the video game studios were with concept artists. So then I applied to Falcon's Treehouse and uh, had no idea what 
uh, themed entertainment design would be. And it's actually so diverse and just absolutely... It's actually it has, similar to a video yeah, game. It has everything in it. It has movie design. It has uh, video game design. It has architectural design. Sound. Sound. I mean, in, and you get to have this whole collection of interesting ideas, you know what I mean, formulating. And they actually become a reality. It's actually you know? better than a movie because, I mean, it's immersive. Absolutely. I yeah, mean, you have is. the movie aspect going on in there, but you also have, like, environments that surround you. You have, like, characters you can interact with. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's physical. In a, it's In yeah. a way, it combines every single bit of entertainment out there yeah, and yeah. puts it into one. It, it yeah. redistributes the proportions a little bit. Mm-hmm. One, of the, one of the things that I always see when I'm interviewing new artists coming in is their focus is so heavily on characters. Yeah. It's always on what Absolutely. is the finite little detail thing. Like, I'm going to just design the hell out of this weapon or this yeah. face yeah. or this yeah. backpack, whatever it is, and trying to pull them out of that and say, look, forget about that. Where are they? Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Show me what the environment looks like. Yeah. Show me what the buildings look like. Mm-hmm. That that's usually where the bulk of our time is spent is in designing place yeah yeah more so than thing yeah absolutely we get a little bit of it mm-hmm. and especially in conjunction with our digital studio where we're having to provide that that previs pre-production service where we yeah. would yeah, that give be. them the idea of a character we would give them the idea of a prop but the bulk of what we do is environmental mm-hmm. which is really different from what a lot of people focus on or, or like to focus yeah. on absolutely. adam when when you were looking into uh, being a game artist did, were you finding yourself kind of falling into that same pattern of uh, being encouraged to draw more of a more of the thing rather than the place? Yeah, abs- absolutely. I think one of the things that video game artists mostly concentrate on is the development of the game. So they, there's just hundreds of sketches and there's hundreds of character designs, props, and, you know, props, clothing. There's, um, and I think the reason why they do that is because games are there's a lot of depth to them usually, absolutely, and you want to explore. And you want to, you know, check out stuff like I'll bring up Uncharted. Um, I think that's a very good ex- explanation for the character design and the environment that it goes in. Because the character was designed to be, uh, you know, a safari explorer. Like he's a he's an explorer. Yeah. And a treasure hunter. And the environment fits that so well. And I think the whole story of it is just holistically uh, sound. It's it's where your where your focus is. You know, yeah. Pat talks about and, comic book yeah. art. Yeah. You're keyframing on a person's face or yeah. on a torso or something else. Yeah, but and the next frame could be a mid shot or, right. or an establishing shot. Mm-hmm. Or, Absolutely. You know, In a film, you're you're constantly doing these cuts to to mm-hmm. get the emotion out of somebody's face or, or whatever it might be. Games like Uncharted, like the Assassin's Creed series, yeah. stuff yes, like that, are absolutely. more in line with what theme park design does, where it's the game is about the world, the park is about the world, the, yeah. the ride is about the world more often than not, and it's it's better to have that the thousand foot yeah. <laughs> observational yeah. view. Yep, yep. Of what's and going it's not on. just about creating the world. It's like it also involves a character, like he said, Uncharted. It's like even though the environments change in Uncharted and you go to different locations, it's still it's still within. It's like you're living this character's life. This is what his life involves. It's like all these different places, but yet they're still part of the same you know, world. It, it feels like there's almost a, a layer of time that's involved. The comic book is very much one frozen moment and you're trying to capture yeah. all the emotion that's there. A video game is you're trying to capture uh, the, you know, the emotion of, of an object, and the place is really, you're trying to capture the emotion of a, it almost feels like of a, the timeless quality of it, right? There's, there's the... If, if you design a place it gives every guest the opportunity to develop their own story for what happens in that place. Right. Even if it's based on an IP or it's based on something that people are very familiar with, mm-hmm. when I'm in that place, it's about me. Mm-hmm. In a theme park, you go wherever you want. Go yeah, you climb go. the wall, look through the window backwards, you know, stand yeah. on your head and look down this hallway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Sure. The detail is everywhere. The difference between being able to spin 360 and see the same environment and turning around 180 and there being cameras and scaffold and microphone and lights and all yeah. that, you know, breaking that immersion entirely. The next one that I have, color. Do you normally find that color starts becoming an important part of the process early on or later? Like, like how frequently do you start with color? Or does you, do you usually start with a black and white sketch? Usually once I hear part of the story or some, at least I know 
where the feel of, of the, the attraction is going, whether it's dark or light or lighthearted or, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that already starts getting me on a track of what kind of colors I'll be using. And so if it's something really dark, obviously I'm going to use like blues and like uh, uh, aqua greens and stuff like that. If it's going to be lighthearted, I'll use bright colors, primary colors and stuff like that or pastelis. So mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, I think that there's also a lot of like today's time, especially with the digital age, since we work mostly in Photoshop, it's kind of more accessible to choose what color options you like and get a better feeling about, out about it, you know what I mean, based off of choosing several colors, yeah. um, several different iterations, you know what I mean. Even it could just happen off of the first iteration, but I think what Pat was saying was it's based off of the feeling at first, you know, and then you kind of refine it as it slowly goes on. What software do you use the most? Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> Photoshop, 100%. Um, we use Illustrator, too, just to, if you need to create something that's a vector mm-hmm. image. As a studio, we're using everything. Yeah, sure. Signage and graphics. Definitely the cutting m- edge. Of- might start in Photoshop, but have to move to Illustrator for production. Yeah, when I started here, I was using Painter. Have you used Painter before? Mm, yep. <laughs> just, Painter. just MS Paint. Yeah, no, it's Painter, <laughs> Corel Painter. That was actually a pretty good program. And it's like, I mean, slowly I moved over to Photoshop. I'd use both at the one time, but it was more like realistic uh, textures and stuff like oil paintings and stuff. But yeah. the thing is, it's like <laughs> customizing your brush on there. You'd be sitting there for like a week just customizing <laughs> because there were so many options. It was just like... Was that something that you were using before coming here? You were using that for... I was other... using that about 50-50 with Photoshop. Okay. Like there were certain things Photoshop couldn't do that I liked in, in Painter and then I'd switch over to Photoshop and, you know, I could save them and open the other one in Photoshop and continue or whatever, but... Eventually, by the time I got here, the Photoshop came out with some new features and stuff that kind of like caught up with Painter, and I just t- totally switched to Photoshop. It's funny that actually he talks about that because I'm um, switching back and forth between programs. I think that that's one big thing that our studio does. And I think when you said several programs, because we don't technically stick with one program. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know there's several artists that do out there, but having that multiple range of mediums and programs, it uh, really gives you an upper hand. Are companies looking for an iconic, crisp visual style, or are they looking for a diversity in styles? What What do you think is more appealing? Probably diversity, I would think so. Mm-hmm. I, that's just my opinion. I think there's, in a in a studio environment, mm-hmm. very rarely are you the only person that's ever going to work on a thing. Yeah. So it's gonna you pass through many hands. Yeah, your your style has to be able to adapt to other people's styles. Mm-hmm so that there's no loss of continuity yeah. among a design package or in a series of images or a series of storyboards because, yeah, there's, no, there's never a guarantee that you're the only person that's ever going to work on it. Yeah. So being able to adapt your style or at least kind of mimic mm. to a reasonable extent somebody else's style is very helpful. I mean, I've, I've found in the, the planning world there's really one look that everybody gravitates to and understands, mm. and it's the the line extension, the little bit of overlap, the little bit of wiggle, yeah. like that general look, everybody just automatically associates that, oh, that's a master plan. And yeah, mm. it, it's that aesthetic. Yeah, but it, it was designed around feeling incomplete mm. so that a client still has the idea of change or control. Mm. It feels architectural, for lack of a better term. I mean, People look at it and go, oh, that's structure. They know how to do structure. Yes. That's measure. <laughs> right. And picking up on that style, it only took maybe six months or so in the industry before I realized that every single person was doing that, was doing that same thing. Yeah. And there had to be a reason for it. Yeah. I think everyone kind of influences each other definitely with their styles. And um, I, I remember I was just this past year, one of my, co- my coworkers, Bruce, and Patrick here, they'll send me an image that they just finished of a concept or an environment or something like that. And in a way, you can learn quite a bit from the artist. And, and it's kind of like master studying or master copies. You know, we used to paint Leonardo da Vinci and a mm. uh, bunch yeah. all those guys, you know. so that was, that was like within the first couple of weeks of a scenic painting yeah. class yeah. in theater. It was always make this wood texture, make this marble texture, make an entablature, and then copy this piece of art. Mm-hmm. And how accurate can you get? Yeah. And it's it's about figuring out how they did it. And then yeah. you sort of realize as you're doing that, you know, there's no, like, step-by-step, step, like, they did this, you know, they did that. There are, but we're, we're thinking about people, you know, back in the day in the 18th century, you know, that didn't have, like, a tutorial 
to tell you, you yeah. know. So yeah. you got to figure it out. You yourself. Just YouTube on there. They had a multi-year you. apprenticeship. Yeah. Yeah. Is what they had. It's it's a lot of experimenting and like understanding it. So so it almost sounds like it's a little more about familiarizing yourself intuitively with the thought process, absorbing yeah. the thought process, so that you can then develop yeah. your own. One one thing that I see people doing with master copies that ten, tends to be the wrong way to look at it is they just want to copy what they see mm. and they don't copy by thinking about it. They're copying They're just, the final product, not the technique. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. The, the modern From day. That you can extrapolate how to like apply it to different, you know, different styles. The modern day version of that is going into somebody else's file and looking at their layer structure. Absolutely. Like yeah. Going into Photoshop and looking at how somebody else layers a file. Yeah. You immediately know what they did and when. Yeah. 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 Well, Actually, good luck looking at my layers. Well, so say, it usually, layers it usually like starts mess. really organized, and, and then like, it's like all the over background there. is super organized and it's foldered and it's colored. Oh yeah. And then the last 150 are just nonsense and, that's when and a they're random starts numbers. Getting yeah. 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 And then you start naming everything <laughs> like physical. revision one, revision two, this layer? No, I don't, new, I don't new don't revision. <laughs> New layer, priorities, layer priorities. 37, copy 20. Yep, absolutely. Yep. What would you look for in a portfolio? As we said earlier, uh, I think it's diversity. Yeah. In style? In, in content. style and in content. I mean, when I was, when I was growing up doing, uh, and I started uh, illustrating, it's like I would go from one style. There was a point where I was like into comic books, and I'd do comic books up until I, until I got to a point where I'm like, okay, that's good enough, and then I'd move on to something like a Disney style. Mm -hmm. and then I move on to like fantasy painting style, and then I'd move on to you know uh, sci-fi or something else, or just pick an artist and I'd see an artist with a certain style that I'd say, oh, I want to kind of get that that same uh, feel as this artist. So maybe I should like practice this style for a while, and then I can incorporate it into other styles and stuff. So just kind of doing a little bit of everything. It's like because uh, I mean, as we were talking earlier, I see a lot of kids doing. Just, just do anime all the time, and that's all they're gonna know. And it's like unless you get a job that's specifically looking for anime, it's like it's gonna be very hard. Yeah, you kind of so. pigeonhole yourself into yeah uh, something that you don't really want to be in, you know, or that's it, why maybe I you do. But yeah, diversity, diversity. It's a, it's a battle for a lot of students now, especially you know, as from a job search perspective, unless you find the one studio that's looking for that exact thing, yep. you're gonna be in trouble. Yep. Exactly, and yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's only a, so many anime studios well, out there. You know, well, but there's a, even you know, take theme parks yeah. as a whole. There's a lot of work going on right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, let's say there's there's 20 attractions that people would want to be working on mm -hmm. right now that are all like they're in development, they're in concept right now across the Disney's and the Universals and and mm -hmm. the, the the Six Flags and Sea Worlds, everybody. F the chances that that one style that you have is the style that a creative director or an art director is looking for for their ride yeah is so remote yeah, <laughs> yeah it's very slim like even even and even Disney, if you, and even if that is a style yeah that's it once you get that job it's like that's it yeah. you're moving on to something else <laughs> it's like it's not going to be that style again it's you're going to free, you're going to freelance for the one gig and then you're yeah. out yeah. yeah even even you look at you know the way that disney has evolved over the last yeah. decade or so they they aren't even doing their own cartoons the way that they used to. Yeah. You know, they're they're going to put an entire attraction in based on the most modern version of Mickey Mouse, which is not the one that we grew up with. Yeah. It bas it's kind of just like don't get too comfortable, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Always keep, change. Things. Yeah. Always keep challenging yourself. I got one more question to wrap us up. Uh, what art style comes most naturally to you, and what has been one of the most challenging? Uh, if you're if you're doing multiple art styles, for me it's realism. Um, I've always kind of had like a keen uh, like eye just for that. I feel like I can understand it. And then when I try and draw something more uh, cartoonish, I, I can do it, but it's just you know it's very difficult for me. Yeah. So, um, I would probably say cartoonish style and comic bookish style is probably where I'm most comfortable. Line work. That's why we work better together. And then uh, <laughs> yeah. And then from that cartoonish style or comic book style, I can add color and then all of, all of a sudden just kind of slip right into fantasy painting. Because all it is is you, you just get rid of the line work and then you have like what you filled it in with color and shading and tones and stuff. So yeah. the, the photo collage thing, yeah. I think, has been easier for me to do. Like if yeah. that's, if I have to convey the organization of an environment or a scene, it's easier to, I'm going to build a model, yeah. I'm going to, 
mash some stuff on top right. of it and then give it to you guys as intent. I think that's been a real game changer, the ability to like photo mash stuff mm -hmm. and just chop up photos and just come up with an image because a lot of times we just don't have the time to do something completely illustrated and then painted and stuff. Mm -hmm. and it would just take twice as long. Yes. Like, you you know, just... I was even recently working on a piece of key art and I started on it and I got half a day into it and I'm like, this is, I'm not going to have this done by it. So I had to just like <laughs> scrap, use what I could and scrap what I could and then just start using, uh, chopping up photos and stuff. And in the end, you're a little disappointed that you didn't get to like illustrate it yourself. But at the same time, it's like what needs to be done needs to be done. So yeah, it is a time aspect. Yeah, I think that about wraps us up. Thanks, everybody. All right, of course. Cool. Oh, thank Thanks you, for having us. Thanks, Amon. Thank you. We want to thank our three panelists again for joining us on this uh, terrific conversation. Cecil, what are your thoughts? It was refreshing to hear the dialogue. Um, really nice to hear that they love our industry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for me personally, that's a really good sign. Um, I totally want to echo their thoughts, though. It is truly, for for me as well, um, knowing our industry embraces, you know, feature film quality content and music, as well as architecture and interactive game design. It's all in one location. So many different disciplines, so many different layers of expertise from so many different places. It all comes together. It all comes together and take advantage of each other. Yeah. The synergy. You know, one of the things that I, I w wanted to kind of elevate also is the sequential art component. Storyboarding. Uh, the storyboarding and, yeah. and how to create the sequence of events that happen. And that's a key component as well Absolutely. that our, our team does. And that's, that's, a, that's an art in itself. It really is. Absolutely. One thing that I loved about that conversation was how we got to talk to, you know, catering the level of detail and the style of your art to your audience. Even when art is such an internal conceptual thing, you know, you still have to be cognizant of who's seeing it. What are you trying to communicate? Is this something to get you excited about the overall concept, about a feeling? Or is this something to communicate? Uh, it's all communicating a, an overall vision, but the style, you know, it's, it's speaking different languages across, even within the same image. Yeah, and I think there's so many layers that people don't realize um, influence and is elevated through the imagery. Yeah. Um, the point of view, um, the lighting. The you know, colors, one of the biggest yeah. things is our vendors embrace us a lot is that the theatrical lighting aspects. So our lighting vendors that help us support creating these brick and mortar environments love our illustrations because it determines the, the temperature and color palette for them to start doing their job. Right. So when Mike was talking about how important these assets are when we create these illustrations, they're tailored to multiple disciplines. One's for the client to get inspired. One is also to to the vendors who are going to have to realize this and react to the vision. Absolutely. And all that with true foundations of um, doability. You know, you talked about some of the profound illustrations that can happen but may not be realized because it's over the top. Um, yeah. We're, we're really good about that. We make sure that we do the underlays, for example, for some of the key art in SketchUp or in Maya. Um, making sure that the venue's scale is accurate yeah. before we go off and illustrate, you know, those key art pieces that kind of reflect the experience. So that's something that's a responsibility of ours yes. uh, when we deliver it. So both the client and uh, everyone who visu visualizes that asset uh, understands, you know, what can actually be realized. And the sense that I get from you and from, you know, talking with those guys is that that's also the level of responsibility that we want to see in portfolios from new and upcoming artists. That's true. That's a very good point. You know, we def typically look at portfolios to see if the potential and capabilities are there. Mm -hmm. You know, usually um, a lot of the candidates don't get exposed to the profound nature of what we do from a brick and mortar standpoint. Uh, some like Adam has, have, you know, gone Came into video the games. video game industry, which fully virtual, exactly, which has no constraints on you know physics. And <laughs> it, it can <laughs> physics, sometimes, it can. but there's uh, a lot of creative freedom. Exactly, you know, there's no life safety involved in <laughs> creating an environment. Except maybe with VR. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't trip over your the, yeah your end chair. Table. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so you know, we we look at it and we have to see if the 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 candidate is capable of. Uh, 
you know, starting to learn about some of the design filters that we have to deal with. But, um, but that was really good dialogue. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll see you in the next episode. That's great. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.